Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome, welcome everyone. Today you have a simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish. So if you would like to listen, if you would like to choose your language, please go to the bottom of your screen and you will see a globe that says interpretation. Please choose the language, English or Spanish. Hoy tienen la opción de escuchar la conversación en inglés o en español. Para escoger su idioma, diríjase a debajo de la pantalla el globo que dice interpretación y escojan el idioma, inglés o español. Entonces comenzamos. Mi nombre es Marcelo Rodríguez y soy bibliotecario de Derecho Internacional en la Biblioteca Daniel Craquiolo de la Escuela de Leyes James E. Rogers en la Universidad de Arizona, en Tucson, Arizona, donde me encuentro actualmente. Antes de comenzar el panel de hoy, me gustaría reconocer que la Universidad de Arizona se encuentra en las tierras de los pueblos indígenas, Tohono Adham y el pueblo Yaqui. El estado de Arizona en Estados Unidos cuenta con 22 pueblos indígenas reconocidos a nivel federal. Yo espero que este reconocimiento sirva de base para inspirar nuestras conversaciones bajo un marco de transparencia, honestidad y reconciliación. Es para mí un inmenso placer y honor seguir esta semana con nuestra conferencia sobre el acceso a la información América Latina y el Caribe. Nuestra conferencia nace del grupo Monitoreando el COVID-19 en América Latina y el Caribe que yo creé y lidero desde marzo del 2020. Actualmente nuestro grupo cuenta con más de 50 miembros ubicados en todas partes del continente de las Américas al igual que internacionalmente. Contamos con bibliotecarios, abogados, periodistas, expertos, académicos, profesores, estudiantes, líderes y muchos más que han ofrecido y compartido su experiencia y conocimiento recopilando reportes sobre situaciones y países en la región. Les invito a todas y todos a que visiten nuestra página que compartiré en el chat próximamente. Esperamos continuar reportando sobre la situación en los próximos meses y sacar un libro trilingüe, español, inglés y portugués, con todos los reportes a principios del próximo año. Esta conferencia se lleva a cabo con la gran aportación de la Asociación Americana de Bibliotecarios Jurídicos, la Escuela de Leyes James E. Rogers y el Centro de Estudios Latinoamericanos de la Universidad de Arizona. Gracias a estas instituciones por su apoyo. Nuestro panel de hoy es el cuarto en una serie de ocho que llevamos a cabo todos los martes y jueves durante el mes de septiembre. No olviden registrarse a los próximos paneles individualmente para participar en las conversaciones. Entonces, ahora le voy a pedir a nuestro panelista Tim Howe que se una y nos dé entonces su presentación. Gracias, Tim. Thank you so much, Marcelo. Hello, everybody. I hope you can um, hear me well. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. So my name, um, yes, is Tim, Tim Howe. I'm one of two um, coordinators of what we're calling the regional interagency platform um, for refugees and migrants from Venezuela. I'm going to be sharing uh, my screen with you now. Um, one second. Good. Okay, I hope you, you can see it. Um, I'm going to start, I've been asked to, um, before the panel starts, um, and we will hear from the other panelists, to share with you a little bit about the situation of refugees and migrants from Venezuela as we see it um, in the region, um, and also to talk a little bit about the work that we do as the interagency coordination platform. I'm going to be indeed um, starting um, with this first point um, 
on how do we see the situation in, in the region. So just to start with a number of figures, and you will see always here on the bottom of the slide, there always is the reference to r4v.info, um, um, which is very much in line, right, with with the uh, with this uh, uh, scheme that Marcelo described um, about access to information. Um, one of our key elements that we're trying to do in our work is to share information and to to um, visualize um, the needs um, of Venezuelans outside of their country. Um, so that's a key element. Um, so when we look at the figures, we can safely say, geographically speaking, this is probably the biggest refugee and migrant situation that we see worldwide. Um, we can also say it is one of the biggest emergency responses outside of Venezuela, again, worldwide. So as of September um, this, this year, um, we are seeing some 5.7 million Venezuelan migrants and refugees in the world, with the vast majority of them, around 4.6 million, residing in Latin America and the Caribbean, as you can see um, in, the, in the map. We're working on a regional response plan. And so there are 17 countries that you see in the colors in the map also just to maybe highlight that the biggest host countries right now are Colombia with um, an estimated figure of around 1.7 million Venezuelans, um, followed by Peru with 1 million, Chile, Ecuador, and Brazil. I would add to that, it's, it's worthwhile visiting our homepage because these figures are very regularly updated. And you might have heard that, for example, in Colombia, um, there's been mentioning of, of more um, Venezuelans actually being in the country. And I can explain in a second why, why this is and also how we get um, to these figures. One key element, and I know I'm, I'm speaking largely to a legal audience here, is that within this, and perhaps this is already the biggest concern that we see, um, We've seen a tradition of welcoming refugees and migrants from Venezuela in, in the region, um, which is very unique. Um, and at large, governments and societies have kept the doors very wide open. And we have many very good stories of, of integration. We might hear a little bit more of this. Um, but at the same time, what we see with growing concern is that out of these 4.6 million in this region, we think around one third of the people are in uh, are with irregular status, meaning they um, might not have come in through um, regular channels. Um, their documents might not be in order. Um, so it's an increasing number. And again, we're going to speak a little bit more about why this is very concerning for us and, and the work that we're trying to do. Um, I wanted to highlight a little bit about the situation of refugees and migrants from Venezuela. And um, many of you might have followed the situation. So I, I really wanted to narrow in a little bit on just the massive impact that COVID-19 has had um, on migrants and refugees from, from Venezuela, as well as affected host communities, of course. Uh, we see a disproportionate impact on refugees and migrants from Venezuela. And, and why is that? The reason is that even before the crisis, many refugees and migrants from Venezuela were already working in the informal sector. And of course, we all know that the pandemic has hit the, uh, the, the informal sector um, the hardest. So what we see is we see an increased dependency on emergency humanitarian assistance and there have been issues with providing humanitarian assistance. For all of us as humanitarian actors, we had to review our operational planning in light of the pandemic. Um, at the same time, we saw a continued number of people leaving Venezuela at all times. And even when borders started being closed in the region, and even when the border between Venezuela and Colombia or Venezuela and Brazil, for example, was closing, people would still cross. The way that they would cross them would be largely through irregular channels. At some point, we did see somehow reverse flows, right? So people returning to Venezuela also because, in part, the situation in their host country because of COVID-19 had turned quite bad. Um, we're not seeing this anymore. So what we see, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about this, is again the trend of continued flows from Venezuela um, into, into the region, and many of them um, going through Colombia, of course. We've seen, and this is very worrying to us, we've seen an Im increase in reports, um, an increase in reports of xenophobia and discrimination. Again, when I said before that at large societies and governments have kept their doors open, 
That's probably still very, very true at the large picture, but we see, including when there are elections coming up, um, but also in, in just the dialogue um, that is being held with affected host communities, we see more elements of this. And I think this is also very much related to just the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had, including on host communities in the region. Um, there's a real hardship to cover basic needs and to access vital services. I'm gonna speak in a second about some of the needs assessments we've done um, to show this uh, perhaps um, a little bit more. Let me go to the next slide because I think it will actually have some of the points that I want to make. There is within the region, the interagency platform and our partners um, are active in 17 countries of the region. What we are doing every year and in regular intervals is we're doing interagency needs assessments. And I would really recommend you to go to the homepage alphabet.info because for each of the countries you can find, um, including by thematic sector, um, more of this kind of analysis. And it's, well, I, I would say it's quite interesting, but it's also very shocking what, what, what we're seeing, what we're finding, what we see when we go um, to the places where many refugees and migrants cross or where they live. Um, so just a couple of highlights here, and I've picked out the example of Colombia, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about Peru and Ecuador, perhaps if, if time allows. But what are some of the key findings that we're seeing? So the three key needs that are very acute, and, and this is about Colombia, but it's true for pretty much the entire region, is access to food. And this has deteriorated quite um, dramatically. So 85% um, of the people um, that we have been interviewing say they have issues getting regular um, access to food. Housing has become um, a big issue, including also linked to evictions during uh, the pandemic. Some governments, as you know, put a hold on that, but it still happened. And it again, particularly happened to people who were already working or living in the informal in setup. Um, employment um, and with that, the access to livelihoods has become a huge challenge. Again, this figure, 31% in Colombia state that they are at risk of eviction. That's a very, very high um, figure. Um, another very shocking figure, and again, this is just to illustrate, um, people 20% saying that they have um, water access only three days or less per week. Think about this also, of course, in the context of the pandemic and COVID-19, and when we think about all the measures um, that we are recommending or that are being recommended rather, um, and, and how this impacts directly, even, even from that angle. And that's just one of the main, many angles. There are a lot of health issues related to that, nutrition issues um, related to that. Um, we are seeing again, this increase on, of irregularity and, and, uh, uh, and regularity. And so of new arrivals that we asked, this is only new arrivals. Um, they said, 68% said, we don't currently have regular status. You will have heard in Colombia, a big announcement was made um, to give the opportunity to regularize. So this is something that we're supporting and it's also politically a very important sign. But again, this theme of irregularity that really concerns us. Um, so again, and here just picking up, um, why is irregularity such a big issue? Well, it's, it's a big issue for, for, for a number of reasons. One of the things that we've seen, which we knew from other regions already before, but that we had never seen so much here, in the region, what was good was that there was largely, um, there were largely pathways for regular entry into countries, but also to um, keep or regularize oneself um, in the course, course of time. We've seen this has become less the case. And what, what is um, a, as a consequence of that is people will still go. And that's a big lesson that we've learned from, from different um, mig migration and refugee contexts, of course. So what it means is that we've seen smuggling networks across borders, but also trafficking networks, including operating within one country, have been increasing their business um, and, and they have been um, more relied upon and, uh, and people have been um, at the hands of uh, transnationally operating networks, including um, in, 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 and have been victims of abuse and exploitation in addition to trafficking, which has quite a specific definition, of course. So that's very concerning. I'm just putting here like the example from Tumis in Peru, where um, about 38% of those leaving through the northern border um, 
are telling us we have been suffering protection incidents along the lines of abuse and exploitation. And there is a lot of individual stories to unpack, of course, in this. So this is very concerning and it tells us quite a bit about the protection situation overall right now as we see it. In terms of movement trends, very quickly, not to take up too much time, but um, we see something new also this year happening. We think it has probably also to do with COVID-19. In addition to the kind of like steady outflow from Venezuela that we see, there's also an increase in northward movements of Venezuelan refugees and migrants who had initially settled in some of the South American countries. Um, so this is true for the Southern Cone, uh, the Cone Sur. It's, it's um, in a way, um, we see this also happening from Chile. Um, we see increased exits from Ecuador to Com uh, Colombia. And we also see, and in a way this is new and very concerning, an increasing number of Venezuelans transiting through the Darian gap here in Panama. Sorry, I'm in Panama. So that's what I'm saying here in Panama towards Mexico and ultimately on the Northern route, um, many of them trying to get to the United States or, Can or Canada. Um, it is a route that is being used also by people from other countries and you you might have heard and seen about this are we seeing also more venezuelans traveling on that route and it's a very very dangerous um one uh, and one where also services provided are um perhaps um yeah they're, they're less than than in other locations this brings me back and I, i'm going to try to close a little bit with that so when i said i'm here to represent the regional um, interagency platform who who are we so we are a humanitarian um, we are centered around the humanitarian response plan, the regional refugee and migration response plan, which um, every year is being renewed with new assumptions, new planning, um, uh, new planning projections um, and thematic chapters on, on different elements and bringing together the 17 countries working very much together also with affected um, governments as well as host communities in the, in the region. So our response is centered around um, that. What are our key objectives? Um, the platform is being co-led by um, the International Organization for Migration. I have a contract with them. And then I have there's a second coordinator who has a contract with UNHCR, um, the High Commissioner for, for Refugees. Um, we co-lead this platform. And really, our objectives are to arrive to common figures, messaging, and advocacy among currently 159 RFV actors. So maybe not all of you might be experts in humanitarian work. When you look at the right side, we've tried to put a couple of logos just to show you we have the World Health Organization, World Vision Plan International, the Red Cross in, in its different shapes and forms are very importantly. Um, but we also have um, donors um, and a wide range of civil society organizations. In fact, more than 90% of the members of the platform are representing civil society or um, in this sense. We also have academic institutions working um, with us. Um, one of our, uh, one of the bigger partners that has been working with us is MPI, for example, Migration Policy Institute, but we're always very open to see about collaboration, just to plant um, that idea here. I mentioned the web portal, sorry to keep on coming back to that, but there's a lot of information around it and a lot of our time is dedicated to updating that information. Um, on the operational side, so one of the things that mark us is we once a year we get together and we're currently in the middle of this we get together to see okay if we want to complement government responses and we want to assist refugees and migrants from venezuela what do we need in terms of financial support and this is a discussion that we're having with international donors also that is the regional refugee and migration response plan it's the articulation of the funding needs that the humanitarian actors have to respond to the needs of refugees and migrants from Venezuela, as well as affected host communities. Um, so this year already, just to give you a couple of figures and then more on the webpage, um, but we've been assisting or reaching um, more than 2 million individuals halfway through basically the year with the funding that we've collectively um, received. Um, and you can go to a dashboard on our page and you can filter for what kind of activities has this been um, spent and how have these people been reached. Um, we have eight national and sub-regional platforms with engagement of host governments. So there's a regional platform that I'm representing, but we have in addition, in all the big countries that I mentioned at the outset, we have a national platform, which likewise has a UNHCR IOM co-lead and has national consultations. And for CONOSUR, the Caribbean, um, and Central America, we have what we call sub-regional platforms without going into too much detail. 
resource mobilization is absolutely key. Like we're here to try to visualize, right? Just how dramatic the needs are. And, and sometimes we are maybe doing a good job on this and sometimes we're maybe not doing a good job, but we're investing quite a bit of time into that. Um, we supported the government of Canada this year to host an international um, donor conference and solidarity with refugees and migrants from Venezuela. And kind of as a follow up to that conference and over time in this year, the, all the 159 partners have received some 417 US dollars in funding. That brings us to around a bit more than one third that what we've been requesting for, for this year. We can always speak a little bit more about what that um, means. Um, there's also a political role. We support a regional political process run by governments, the so-called Quito process, which brings together the host countries to discuss around um, best practices, around possible solutions, um, how to do things differently, harmonization of approaches. And we're also supporting that, but that is the government um, side of things. Um, we have a joint special representative, Eduardo Stein, who's quite known in the um, region, who also in many ways represents a lot of what we're doing under the, the platform. So just going, and with that, I'm gonna be finishing um, our, response structure is a sectorial one, meaning we have specific groups that deal with specific areas of expertise and interest. So there's a shelter sector, there's a protection sector, a nutrition sector. You will see all of these here on the right side. Perhaps the bigger takeaway, including for the audience that we have today is here. Um, if you have an interest uh, in any of these, these areas of work, get in touch with us because what we want to do is we also want to have communities of knowledge and, of course, of operational practice, but also communities of knowledge to make the work and all of these feel better. We are really, it's a very open platform. Um, the, the, uh, the regional platform is a very open platform in this sense. Um, the regional response plan every year is informed by joint needs assessment. I quoted a few points, but there are many more points and we have this basically for all, all countries and they're publicly available. Then we go into a process of identifying national priorities. So one of the clear national priorities that we see across the board is how do we combat irregularity in a good way, right? By providing alternatives, by giving um, the chance to regularize one status and so on. Consultations with national governments, and this are very key. Every, every figure that you saw, that I've been providing so far, particularly on populations. These are actually figures that we consult with governments. So it's not just us putting out a figure um, of 4.6 million in the region, but it's a figure that we constantly consult with governments. And sometimes they might have objections and then we will change um, the figure. So this is the, a bit the process, how, how we work. It's really um, respecting also the role of governments because that's very important, obviously, in this kind of response. Um, we have a humanitarian development nexus. I could, I could probably, um, we could probably spend a whole webinar on it. The one point maybe I would like to make is it's different from other response plans and other region when you look, for example, Syria, Yemen. Um, what we have here, one sector that is more development oriented um, is integration. And, and that goes back to the unique setup we've had in this region, very much benefiting from overall relatively open um, doors. Um, to Venezuelans and, and panelists might want to, to add a bit um, um, to that. Um, I think with that, I would maybe leave it at that. There's much more that, that could be said. This was meant to be a little bit of an opening. I hope I didn't go into too much detail and didn't bore you to death about what we are doing. Um, but in a way, it's also a good opportunity just for us to share and really also welcome any ideas and suggestions um, if anybody wants to, to engage. Thank you so much. Back to you, Marcelo. Sí, muchísimas gracias por la presentación. Yo creo que es, es como el, el, la información fundacional para entonces nosotros tener una gran conversación. Um, um, y, y yo sé que cuando te contactamos fue casi como al final y entonces decidiste y, eh, unirte al grupo y muchísimas gracias por eso. Antes tenemos a nuestra moderadora Eunice Lee, mi compañera y amiga. Antes de... de de seguir con la conversación, me gustaría quizás introducirla para que Eunice pueda seguir con la conversación en el panel. Um, Eunice Lee es profesora de la Escuela de Leyes James E. Rogers en la Universidad de Arizona, conmigo aquí en Tucson. Su investigación se concentra en temas de migración, ciudadanía y fronteras. La profesora Lee trabaja en la coyuntura de los temas jurídicos de leyes de migración 
constitucional, administrativa, internacional y de derechos humanos para comprender los derechos de los inmigrantes y refugiados en los Estados Unidos. Como investigadora jurídica y antropóloga, la profesora Lee también se basa en la teoría social y los métodos etnográficos en su trabajo. En su práctica anterior, la profesora Lee fue abogada en el proyecto de derechos de los inmigrantes de la Unión Americana de Libertades Civiles, ACLU en inglés, donde presentó una demanda colectiva de impugnaciones constitucionales a la detención migratoria obligatoria. Además, la profesora Lee fue la codirectora del Centro de Estudios de Género y los Refugiados de la Universidad de California en Aston. Ella cuenta con un Juris Doctor de la Escuela de Leyes de Yale y un doctorado en Antropología de la Universidad de California en Berkeley. Leonis, el piso es tuyo. Thank you so much, Marcelo, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so sorry about I had connection issues and sort of a comedy of errors, but I'm so delighted to be joining you today. Um, and thanks to Mr. Howe for that wonderful overview of trends with respect to Venezuelan refugees and migrants in the region, including the impact of COVID, as well as um, you know, regional coordination responses and plans. So I do want to note that um, Tim Howe is one of two coordinators of the interagency platform for refugees and migrants from Venezuela, the R4V, um, of course, that he's been speaking about, currently based in Panama. And he's also worked with the International Organization for Migration and other UN agencies for close to 15 years, primarily in areas related to migrant protection, mixed migration, and counter trafficking, um, including in emergency contexts. So his previous postings have included positions in Kenya, Tanzania, Thailand, and Costa Rica, as well as in Geneva, Switzerland. He holds a master in law from the London School of Economics and is a certified mediator. Um, and he's also published very widely in different academic journals, um, including on the principle of non refoulement and the work of international criminal tribunals on gender-based violence. So we're very fortunate to have gotten that wonderful and informative overview from Mr. Howe. Um, I want to now introduce our two, our next two panelists who will be joining us for this part of the discussion. Um, Ivan Garza Garza is currently an associate at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University Law Center. Prior to joining the O'Neill Institute, she worked as a human rights specialist at the Rapporteurship on the Rights of Migrants of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And additionally, she worked at the Center for Justice and International Law, leading America's network on nationality um, and statelessness and on the strategic litigation of diverse cases at the international level. Ms. Garza also has done consultancy work for diverse institutions, including the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and has lectured classes and capacity building workshops in diverse countries in the Americas. She has obtained her law degree from the Facultad Libre de Derecho de Monterrey in Mexico, and she also holds an LLM in International Legal Studies from Georgetown University Law Center and an MA um, in human rights and humanitarian action with a specialty in diplomacies from Sciences Po, PSIA, and a master's degree from in legal argumentation from the University of Alicante. Our next speaker, um, David Sanchez Velasquez, holds a master's degree in public and social policies from the Pompo Fabra University in Spain, and he is also a lawyer um, who graduated from the Pontifica Universidad Católica del Perú. He has worked at the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights and the Ministry and Interior of the Interior of Peru in areas related to the defense and protection of the rights of migrants and refugees. Mr. Sanchez has also worked at the UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean and at the International Organization for Migration. He recently published a book on Peru as a refuge country, the challenges of the Peruvian state in the design and implementation of a national policy for the reception and integration of refugees. So we are very, very lucky um, to have both of these panelists here. So if our panelists could please turn on their cameras. Um, I will begin our set of questions shortly. Wonderful, hello. So my first question is for Ms. Garza. And 
It relates to how does the international and regional, how do international and regional legal instruments guarantee a right to access information for all migrants? Thank you, Yanis, and thank you um, to Arizona University for the opportunity to share this panel with my colleagues uh, today. I'm really happy to, to be a part of this uh, exchange on access to information for Venezuelan migrants. So with regards to your question, um, and I think this relates with a question that was uh, previously posted in the Q&A uh, channel, um, there are several various uh, barriers that Venezuelan migrants have to overcome in order to um, achieve regular status, which as Tim noted, is one of um, the main challenges right now. Uh, many of these migrants, 68% to be precise, as Tim said, um, currently hold irregular status. But the good news is that the various international and regional legal instruments provide access to information guarantees for all migrants that ensure uh, that migrants can hold all the information with regards to their situation in a specific country, their rights, and the way to access those mechanisms to achieve regular status. And how do those do these instruments provide for that? So to start with, it's very important to note that Article 19 of the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, encompasses the right to access to information by saying that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. And this right includes the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. As such, this article from the Universal Declaration has also been uh, encompassed in the International Convention for the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Their Families. Um, and in that instrument, Article 13 basically also states that migrant workers and members of, of their family have uh, this right. At the regional level, and I will be mentioning, uh, referring to the regional standards as well, because specifically this panel focuses on uh, Venezuelan migrants. And as Tim already said, the majority of these migrants are currently in states that are parties to um, the American Convention and as such are binded uh, by the criteria, the norms and the legal uh, jurisprudence of the Inter-American System of Human Rights. And at this level of the Inter-American System of Human Rights, Article 13.1 of the American Convention also protects freedom of thought and expression and encompasses the right uh, to information by saying that um, the right to freedom of thought and expression also includes the freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers. And it also adds and goes beyond the declaration uh, to say that this, uh, not only frontiers, but also uh, the way in which the information must be provided orally in writing, in print, or in form of art, or through any other medium of, of one choice. And this is especially relevant to the context of migrants, since language is one also of the most common barriers that they face. So uh, currently, standards have been evolving to uh, to include as part of this right, the obligation of states to provide information in a way that can be understood by the migrant person or the migrant child that is uh, arriving at the border or at the country of destination. Um, and it also, of course, encompasses a consideration for cultural, uh, cultural considerations uh, that mod must be integrated and analyzed when providing protection to these persons. So I want to um, take this opportunity to highlight that the Inter-American System of Human Rights has historically developed the standards of access to information in the context of migration directly under the scope of due process guarantees that are also applicable to migration proceedings, which, as we know, are mostly administrative in their nature. As such, the system has understood that access to information is vital for persons to understand their rights, especially the right to consular assistance in, for example, um, asylum proceedings. These standards sit today as jurisprudential criteria 
because they have been included in the landmark case Veleslor v. Panama of 2010, in which the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, through the analysis of a case of migration detention, found a violation to the right to information and effective consular assistance under Article 7 and 8 of the American Convention. More recently, however, the notion of access to information has been expanded to go beyond the mere notions of due process guarantees and access to justice. All of these novel understandings of access to information also take into account the importance of protecting the right to privacy and confidentiality, especially when considering the principle of non refoulement an essential consideration for asylum law. The aforementioned notions are integrated today in a document issued by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in December 2019, Resolution 419, containing the Inter-American Principles for the Rights of All Migrants Regardless of Status, is a document in which these notions aim to expand migration law and human rights as they exist today in international instruments to include, among others, the right to access to information with regards to the right of children to be heard, express their views and participate in judicial proceedings, access to justice and the right to effective remedies, access to information in the context of victims of human trafficking and their protection. That is a, a very relevant issue as Tim also mentioned in his presentation. This document also encompasses access to information as an essential element of guarantees of cross-border justice uh, in order for families who are seeking uh, information on the relatives that have migrated. The, it's also vital for um, the guarantee of the right to truth, the guarantees of due legal process in migration proceedings, as I said before, in making sure that persons uh, receive information on their legal status, the legal process, and the rights within this process, the protection of their information and observance of the principle of confidentiality, as well as other guarantees specific to children and adolescents, like the right to be fully in, informed throughout the entire procedure, together with, with their legal guardian and legal advisor of their rights and of any relevant information that could affect them in a simpler, clearer, and accessible way that can be understood by them. Among others, uh, the principles also encompass the right to information and guarantees for protection of personal data that could be gathered by authorities in the context of, for example, provision of health services. And the principles are very specific and very um, clear in setting those safeguards, in protecting uh, the compliance with this right, and also in establishing the limits of uh, access to information and privacy considerations. That, uh, how I said and how I mentioned before, is vital in uh, when considering asylum proceedings where the principle of confidentiality is a general first rule. As such, um, I would also like to mention that access to information has also been a central priority of protection under the co context of COVID-19, where both the Commission and the Inter-American Court in their resolutions concerning the pandemic have urgently called on states to ensure access to information and exchange of information to ensure the rights of all migrants in accessing health services and mobility uh, facilitation proceedings for their uh, return home or their continuation to other territories. So I will leave it there for now and thank you, Eunice. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to shift gears a little bit for my first question for Mr. Sanchez from the sort of regional and international framework to the country specific context. So I wanted to ask, in, you know, in terms of um, access to public information. Um, Ms. Garza talked a lot about the various that happen barriers at different um, regional international levels and sort of what frameworks guide them. But what are the main challenges in terms of the process, um, uh, in terms of access to public information with regard to the process of immigration regular, regularization in Peru? Okay, in primer lugar, buenas tardes. Eh, quisiera felicitar y, a, y agradecer a, a Marcelo Rodríguez y a todo su equipo por la eh, organización y la generosa invitación a este evento. 
En, en relación a la, a la pregunta eh, formulada, eh, debemos señalar que el Perú eh, se ha caracterizado durante las dos últimas décadas del siglo XX por ser un país emisor y no receptor de migrantes. La grave crisis hiperinflacionaria y el conflicto armado interno propiciaron que aproximadamente 3 millones de nuestros compatriotas eh, buscaran eh, mejor futuro en eh, diversos países del orden. Y ello ha quedado evidenciado sobre todo por la carencia de políticas públicas en beneficio de la población migrante y refugiada en el Perú. Y ello ha quedado eh, manifiestamente eh, evidenciado sobre todo en el, en el reciente fenómeno migratorio venezolano en el Perú. Eh, a modo de ejemplo, la encuesta dirigida a la población venezolana que reside en el Perú, denominada la EMPOVE, es una encuesta elaborada por el Instituto Nacional de Estadística e Informática del Perú en el año 2018, indicaba que tan solo el 2,9% de los migrantes eh, venezolanos que contaban con estudios universitarios y de posgrado culminados habían logrado culminar su título, eh, o habían logrado homologar su título profesional en el Perú. Eh, al respecto, eh, lo, el 34% eh, de estos migrantes encuestados señaló que no inició los trámites para homologar su título por no tener, eh, por carecer de la inf de información sobre dicho procedimiento. Eh, la misma encuesta, ad además, en otra de sus preguntas, eh, eh, revela que eh, menos del 50% de los niños venezolanos en edad escolar estaban insertados en el sistema educativo peruano. Entre las principales dificultades esgrimidas por los padres de familia para no matricular a sus hijos en las escuelas públicas peruanas estaba el desconocimiento del funcionamiento del sistema educativo eh, peruano. Un 30% de los, de los padres de familia venezolano manifestaban que eh, desconocían eh, el procedimiento para matricular a sus hijos en las escuelas públicas peruanas. Eh, de igual manera, eh, en un eh, reciente estudio de, de, de una casa investigadora, Equilibrium Sende, sobre el proceso de regularización en el Perú, se, eh, eh, se indicó, se reveló eh, que eh, tanto la población migrante y refugiada como los funcionarios públicos de la Comisión Especial para Refugiados del Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores o de la Superintendencia Nacional de Migraciones desconocían en, en gran parte eh, eh, los beneficios que daban toda la serie de documentos migratorios que existen en el Perú. El Perú actualmente tiene una multiplicidad de documentos migratorios, el carnet de extranjería, el permiso temporal de permanencia, el carnet del permiso temporal de permanencia, el carnet de solicitante de refugio, la autorización de trabajo, y muchas veces los migrantes y eh, refugiados acuden a las instituciones públicas para eh, solicitar información, y esta información no es del todo clara, es más bien confusa, los propios funcionarios no tienen eh, clara la información sobre toda esta multiplicidad eh, de documentos. Aunado a esto, eh, dado el contexto eh, de la pandemia, muchas de las instituciones públicas peruanas aún no atienden de manera eh, presencial. Si bien es cierto, han logrado... Eh, establecer algunos canales de atención virtuales. Eh, estos se encuentran actualmente saturados en las líneas telefónicas, a pesar de que atienden las 24 horas, muchas veces los migrantes señalan de que no pueden eh, completar la llamada, se suele eh, colgar, eh, la información que les brindan tampoco es del todo clara y muchas veces necesitan de una atención presencial. Eh, debemos de tener eh, presente además eh, que eh, eh, la población migrante venezolana en la actualidad aquí en el Perú se encuentra en una especial situación de vulnerabilidad y por lo tanto no cuentan ni con los medios ni con los recursos económicos muchas veces para acceder a un eh, aparato tecnológico, llámese de celular o una computadora, para eh, conocer eh, el acceso a una escuela pública, a un centro de salud, o incluso iniciar su procedimiento de regularización migratoria. Eh, en ese sentido, pues, eh, eh, si bien es cierto, algunas agencias de cooperación internacional están desarrollando una serie de jornadas de, de orientación para migrantes, eh, desde nuestra perspectiva, estas no se encuentran del todo articuladas, se ha logrado evidenciar, además, que, que existe 
información contradictoria, dispar entre estas eh, diversas agencias y por lo tanto desde nuestra perspectiva es eh, necesario que el Estado peruano a través de las dos principales eh, instituciones encargadas de la regularización migratoria, que son la Comisión Especial eh, para Refugiados y la Superintendencia Nacional de Migraciones, desarrollen una estrategia comunicacional, una estrategia de atención personalizada y de acompañamiento para la población eh, eh, refugiada y migrante eh, venezolana, eh, sobre todo, dado que, como bien ha señalado Tim, en el Perú actualmente eh, residen más de un millón de ciudadanos venezolanos y apenas la, la mitad, aproximadamente 500.000, cuentan con algún eh, documento eh, de regularización migratoria. Aún falta por regularizar a más de eh, medio millón de ciudadanos venezolanos en nuestro país y, como eh, bien he señalado, eh, no tienen eh, el acceso a la totalidad de información y la información que actualmente se les brinda a través de medios virtuales eh, no es del todo clara, es confusa para ellos, muchos de ellos no tienen en grado de instrucción y por lo tanto se les dificulta a la hora de leer todos los procedimientos y necesitan por ende una atención personalizada y presencial para que, este para que todo el procedimiento de regularización migratoria se lleve con éxito en nuestro país. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a second question now for Ms. Garza, and that is related to the current situation that we all find ourselves in, which is, of course, the, this um, COVID pandemic. So how can access to information be facilitated in light of the current COVID context to ensure access to refugee status and also access to justice mechanisms um, for Venezuelans per Venezuelan persons um, who are migrating? Thank you, Eunice. And actually, uh, this question also goes back to what Tim and David just mentioned. Uh, first of all, I want to um, highlight that even before COVID, international organisms had already co uh, called on states to flexibilize the requirements to access international protection mechanisms for Venezuelan migrants. Among the most common elements in this call for states were the need to consider expired passports as valid, uh, as, as also David just mentioned, and the elimination of requirements such as apostilles, uh, were, uh, which were really common, especially at the beginning and um, during 2016, 2017, when the first migrants started to, um, the first like more number of Venezuelan migrants started to move around the region. Um, and this is very important especially in contexts like Colombia, where diplomatic relations have ended now, and Venezuelan migrants, those who are in irregular status, and even um, those who are in regular status, it's very difficult for them to access um, the, the means and the mechanisms to regain the possession of certain documents that are mostly required in, um, in regularization proceedings. So, For just to mention some passports, for example, an expired Venezuelan passport in order to have another passport in, in Colombia is basically right now not possible because there's no consulates. And, um, and going back to Venezuela and actually following the procedure to regain a passport not only implies a very high cost for all migrants, but it's basically a very long time uh, proceeding that uh, will, will just make it really inaccessible. Um, and also other considerations such as, uh, for example, the time or the change among uh, status, for example, in Colombia and in Peru, at the beginning uh, of these uh, fluxes of migration, the governments uh, established some policies to give temporary uh, protection visas and status, and those status have had to be revised and renewed. And those can serve, for example, those databases can serve to facilitate access to new temporary or long durable solutions for these populations. So um, also international organizations have uh, urged states to use this information they already have uh, to facilitate access to more long-term uh, 
type of status. And that can uh, be not only through the normal and common uh, mechanisms provided by the conventions, uh, like asylum proceedings, but also visas that each country have adopted. And that could be uh, the temporary protection mechanisms in Colombia, the other temporary protection mechanisms in Peru, or uh, the special consideration of Venezuelan populations like refugees under the definition established by the Cartagena Declaration, uh, which is an expanded notion um, of, um, of a consideration of the need uh, of credible fear, right, to return. And so this credible fear is usually the standard set by the 1951 Convention to Access Refugee Status is commonly uh, determined by only by the 1951 Convention and its uh, 1967 protocol. But in the Americas, we are very lucky to have the uh, Cartagena Declaration, which expanded this notion uh, and under this notion, uh, one of grave and mass violation of human rights is considered as a base for um, for refugee status. And most countries in the region have uh, already included this expanded definition in their legal frameworks to consider Venezuelans uh, as refugees. So that is also another solution. But how do they? How can they access right? under COVID. One, actually, one of these expanded notions uh, contained in the Cartagena Declaration is the consideration of health. And we all know that access to health services in Venezuela is very uh, is, a, is a situation of concern, is very precarious right now. So with COVID, and as COVID develops, and the po political context in Latin America is uh, changing a lot, especially in the last two years, with the changes of government and administrations, as Tim noted, Venezuelans are now continuing to migrate among the region, especially to the north, um, through Panama, to the Darien and Colombia, but aiming at arriving in Mexico or the US. And in this process of continuous mobility, it is vital for states to have effective and widespread communication campaigns that can ensure that migrants receive and have the information on how to access the various different mechanisms, because as I just mentioned, every country has their own mechanisms to regularize this population. And that is a big challenge uh, because they can, for example, a migrant that is currently in Venezuela and wishes to move to Mexico can have a status in Venezuela, but that doesn't mean that this status will be a, a account, will be also valid in Mexico. In Mexico, there is another legal framework. So this is also poses a challenge for Venezuelan migrants as they need to navigate various legal frameworks and they don't, as, as much as they can know one, it, it is not sufficient to um, move around the region. And so that, that makes a call to have maybe a more harmonized approach to these mechanisms that states should aim at having some basic shared uh, mechanism that could be a solution, but also, um, communication campaigns that can share this information widely. And for that, uh, access to internet and communication resources is also vital and must be facilitated by states. This means that when migrants are arriving in a border, they should have access uh, to, to the means to access this information, where, whether it can be through people assisting them or through having uh, the provision of the required equipment to access internet and other type of means to receive this information. And this was also noted by, by David, how is a, it is a barrier. Uh, of course, this is this is more important in context where the person doesn't speak the language, like for example, a Venezuelan going to Brazil that possibly doesn't speak Portuguese or going to Trinidad and Tobago, not speaking English, et cetera. And it goes on and on and on for the different context. And, and especially under the COVID context, and we have been seeing, as Tim mentioned, that migration is not stopping, it is actually increasing. Be why? Because the uh, underground reasons, underlying reasons for migration, uh, like seeking better conditions, are being more and more evident by and increasing by, by COVID. So especially relevant is the consideration on information of access to health services and vaccines. Uh, as mobility and shelter increase the risk of this population, which is already in a very vulnerable situation. And something that I want to really highlight here is that migrants are also and should be included in vaccination plans among the region, and that health-related considerations 
for each of these persons should be also analyzed and considered as part of the principle of non refoulement and in asylum related proceedings. This means that authorities should consider the health situation of, uh, that migrants are facing, whether it's individual consideration, the specific situation of a migrant and the wide uh, global situation of COVID um, as reasons that must be part of the analysis that authorities make uh, when receiving migrants at the border and when assisting them in health-related situations and, of course, in accessing COVID-related solutions such as vaccination. Um, and, well, thank you. Really uh, available to, if there are any other questions on this, happy to, to share. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, so my next question for Mr. Sanchez follows on both of your comments. Uh, for the overall discussion today, Mr. Sanchez, you previously spoke about the challenges and barriers that migrants face in accessing information across numerous vectors. Um, ISCARSA presented some important steps for states to take, um, both in light of COVID as well as generally, both domestically and in coordination with other states. So looking particularly to the context of Peru, what kind of policies should the Peruvian state adopt to improve access to information for migrants and refugees in Peru? Sí, como, como, como he señalado, eh, es necesario que el Estado peruano desarrolle una política pública de acogida e integración para la población refugiada e inmigrante venezolana en nuestro país. En ese sentido, eh, desde diversos frentes se ha señalado que el Estado peruano debe eh, paulatinamente eh, abrir sus fronteras eh, a través del CEBAF, que es el Centro eh, de Atención Binacional en Atención Fronteriza con, con el Ecuador, a fin de que se conozca la cifra exacta de ciudadanos venezolanos que están ingresando a nuestro país, a fin de esa manera también eh, de luchar contra el tráfico ilícito de inmigrantes. Actualmente se ha producido una explosión de mafias vinculadas al tráfico ilícito de inmigrantes y trata de personas en la frontera norte peruana, dado que la frontera está cerrada, aprovechan eh, caminos ilegales, trochas, eh, para cobrarles en algunos casos cifras exorbitantes para cruzar la frontera peruana. En ese sentido, eh, el Estado peruano, conforme vaya avanzando el proceso de vacunación, debe iniciar eh, la apertura de su frontera eh, lo antes posible. Y asimismo, eh, como he señalado, creo que las entidades públicas encargadas del proceso de regularización, en Comisión Especial para Refugiados y la Superintendencia Nacional de Migraciones, deben iniciar eh, una atención presencial una, y diseñar dentro de su estructura orgánica algunos servicios de información. Eh, es, es vital eh, que eh, exista personal suficientemente capacitado con, eh, que les pueda brindar información de manera ágil, sencilla. Tenemos eh, personas de distintos eh, grados de instrucción, muchos de ellos, como he señalado, no tienen eh, acceso al Internet, a un celular, a un medio eh, tecnológico. A muchos se les dificulta incluso eh, el acceso al Internet y aún accediendo a la información no saben cómo procesarla, cómo reunir toda la documentación para su proceso de regularización o para simplemente matricular a un niño en una escuela o acceder a los, eh, al, al seguro público que brinda el Estado peruano. Eh, en ese sentido... Eh, Debemos también de señalar que el Estado peruano es aún un país en, en vías de desarrollo, que en esta empresa no puede estar solo, debe de contar con el apoyo de los bancos de desarrollo, con las agencias de cooperación internacional, la OIM, la CNUR, que han tenido eh, ya experiencias muy parecidas, eh, tanto en Colombia como, como en el Ecuador, y que creo que se puede eh, replicar aquí en el Perú y centralizarlo a través de estas instituciones, de que haya una información eh, pareja, eh, articulada, coordinada, y la población eh, migrante y refugiada venezolana, en especial situación de vulnerabilidad, pueda acceder de manera gratuita, de manera fácil, ágil, y que se inicie el proceso de regularización al mayor número posible de ciudadanos venezolanos. Actualmente, dado eh, la, la, la carencia de, de esta información, de esta estrategia comunicacional, también había una explosión de, 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 de tramitadores, como se denomina aquí en el Perú, que les cobran también cifras exorbitantes por realizar algún trámite que ante el Estado peruano es, es totalmente gratuito. Entonces, es, son, es, están siendo estafados un gran número de ciudadanos eh, venezolanos 
por eh, no tener acceso a la información y la información que se les está brindando incluso, como he señalado, es dispar, es confusa, muchas veces incluso para un profesional, yo he tenido la oportunidad de revisar la información y está redactado en un lenguaje a veces académico o, eh, como diríamos aquí en el Perú, abogadil, ¿no? muy, muy técnico, que cualquier persona de a pie no puede eh, entender y comprender en, en su totalidad, en su cabalidad. Y, asimismo, bueno, dado también que existe un, un gran un número de inmigrantes venezolanos, un millón, como bien se ha señalado, Creemos que estos servicios, eh, este servicio de, de orientación, de acompañamiento, de información al migrante y refugiado en el Perú debe centrarse sobre todo en aquella población en extrema situación de vulnerabilidad. Y me refiero en especial a, a niños no acompañados, a mujeres embarazadas, a personas eh, de la comunidad LGTBIQ, a adultos mayores, a personas eh, con discapacidad que... Eh, tienen aún eh, mayores dificultades para eh, acceder a la información eh, pública más básica en el Perú. Eh, creemos, como ya he señalado, que esto se puede llevar a cabo replicando eh, medidas que ya se han realizado en Colombia y en el Ecuador y eh, teniendo el respaldo tanto técnico como económico de las agencias de cooperación y de los bancos de desarrollo. Y de esa manera el Perú pueda... Eh, progresivamente desarrollar una política nacional de acogida e integración eh, para los migrantes y refugiados venezolanos y se convierta poco a poco pues, en una sociedad eh, de acogida y que los venezolanos puedan integrarse eh, a nuestra sociedad. Como ya lo hemos hecho eh, eh, con anterioridad, eh, eh, el Perú es una, un crisol de, de múltiples razas, de múltiples... Eh, de, de personas de, provenientes de, de distintos puntos cardinales, eh, tenemos influencia africana, china, y eso se, se nota en nuestra gastronomía incluso. Y creo que además eh, eso sería de suma importancia eh, para sumar una nueva identidad al llamado país de todas las sangres, que es, que es el Perú. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I actually wanted to um, bring the discussion back to Mr. Howe, uh, who gave us, you know, the wonderful overview of, of both trends as well as regional responses and just ask him to remark a little bit um, on, on how the R4V plan, as well as other initiatives he's working on, sort of complement the responses and recommendations by our other panelists. Oh, no, fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, it's it's difficult to, it's it's a very rich discussion. Muchas gracias, David y Ivonne. Um, I, I think maybe to just pick up on a few points that were mentioned also on the question in the Q&A, where I think Jasmine is asking, what are some of the barriers to regularization? I actually think David in particular picked up on a, on a number of them and also, also Yvonne. But maybe just to expand a little bit on that. I think it's really, it's a, it's a great question, but we would need probably one year of a webinar to really unpack this. Because one part is definitely, yes, the access to information. And I, and I think that's come out very clear. We see this right now in Colombia, where the, um, where the government has made this historic announcement of saying, we are ready to regularize what might be 2 million people in irregular situation. That is a pretty historic statement to make when you look around in all of the world, that is very rare to see that. Um, so we can look at this right now in terms of, and then what Yvonne mentioned before, information, like how, how well are refugees and migrants from Venezuela informed about this? And not only that there is this Estatuto now, but also on how exactly it works. And I think David also made a number of of points on this. It's not only to say we put in place a law and policy, but then the devil lies in the details. How are people getting the information about it? And I would just invite all of us. I think we should be part of this process right now. We should observe it. We should watch it. We should support it politically, but also look at how is information, for example, disseminated and what are the barriers? And we already see, and, and maybe just linking back a little bit here to the bigger picture, One of the key elements indeed is like, what is a barrier to regularization? One very easy one is also people want to move on. People are very mobile. 
even between Colombia and Venezuela, we have what we call the pendulares, the people who are going back and forth. That is still a thing we saw during COVID-19. Some people try to travel back when they can. Um, the diaspora is very well organized. I'm sure David could much say much more about this than, than me. A very important player, but it's very fluid. It's not, it's not that black and white. That's definitely one element and people moving on indeed. Some people do not want to regularize themselves in Colombia, but they might want to go further down. They might have family. It's, it's, a very, it's very, very complex. Again, we would need to unpack this very well. I would add one third barrier though to regularization. And, and that is one, and Yvonne mentioned on the importance of access to asylum procedures. Um, she mentioned, uh, Yvonne, you mentioned the Cartagena Declaration. And there's a lot of what we see when you look at, and we have some statistics that on that also on our webpage. In fact, most refugees and migrants from Venezuela who have a regular status, have a migratory status. It's a rel relatively low number who have actually claimed asylum. And when you look at the statistics, it's relatively few countries that in reality really grant that status. And that in a way is of concern, right? But at, at the same time, we always need to look at regularization as a whole machinery of different channels that exist. And the point is important. We need to keep an um, overview on it. We need to harmonize it, but it's also very different in each country. And, and I think Yvonne said this very, very clearly, and I couldn't agree more um, with it. But what happened to these channels, both asylum channels, um, but also migratory regu regularization? What happened towards it during the pandemic? Many of these um, procedures were simply suspended. Borders were shut. Procedures were suspended for a long time. Some of them are still suspended. Some of them have a massive backlog, right? So another barrier to regularization, even if people have the information, even when we think people want to regularize themselves, even if there's no fear, no suspicion of the process, no misinformation, which would probably be another big thing to unpack, even then we see often the processes in reality are maybe less available than they look like on, on paper. And that's a big um, challenge. I, I think there are many different um, elements to it also. David absolutely correctly mentioned the issue of unaccompanied uh, migrant refugee children, um, families uh, being separated. So looking also for each other often along this long route. Um, again, there's a lot to, to unpack, but I, I just want to say it is really complex. And, and again, I think, for all of us. And when you're asking me, Eunice, I think when you look at the response of R4E, what we're trying to do is we try to work in all these different actor, in areas. But sometimes we, of course, very operational. So when you ask me about the right to information, I will immediately jump to the importance of informing people in our services. We have one of our mechanisms that we have, it's called um, Espacios de Apoyo, support spaces, where we provide medical support but in every and we provide food and maybe even shelter but we also try to always have a legal service or an information sharing point and i think this is something that we need to to mainstream now again that's a very operational response and i think again a little bit the invite to say like we need to have more involvement and i'm sure david from what you mentioned i i i feel like you're very much in the middle of the debate which needs the operational the historic and the academic readout so to me that's a very uh, good model and again just to encourage right if you if you want to get involved in some of our work the same as we want to uh, become part of um, other people's work um, very welcome and sorry I could go on but I, I'm going to stop here wonderful uh, so if you have a question please put it in the Q&A and I say, I have a question for perhaps all of our panelists or those of you who want to jump in. And we've talked a lot about different possible solutions across different sectors. So the government, um, civil, ser ser civil service, or civil society, rather, and of course, we're here at a university hosting. So I was just wondering if you could remark on the role of the state vis-a-vis um, civil society, especially, and where it's appropriate or necessary for the state to really provide access to information and what role, um, where it might even be preferred or perhaps more feasible for civil society, um, NGOs, et cetera, to, to pr be providing that access. Yvonne, 
Well, if I can jump in just to, because I think this, this uh, question that you are sharing with us, Eunice, also links with what uh, Tim was saying regarding the existence of various mechanisms and how um, regularization is not just a one-way solution. Um, I think states among the region and specifically in Latin America, a region that has been uh, globally known for its um, welcoming asylum uh, policies in the past, but also today uh, with this uh, Venezuelan migration situation. Um, I think it's something that, and going back to what Tim mentioned with regards of the refugee definition contained in the Cartagena Declaration, I think that's an advantage that has been um, unused. And, and that's why I, I like to bring it up again, because I think that um, even if uh, long-term solutions like the one that Colombia is envisioning now, and which is, I'd, I'd say, yes, also a very unique solution and a very unique example um, that the region is giving to the world. I think that refugee status, as understood by the Cartagena Declaration, would be an easy, easy setup, I'd say. And I think some states like Mexico at the beginning uh, started to do that, but then Mexico changed its position when the government also changed. So at the beginning, Mexico was recognizing all Venezuelan persons based on the Cartagena Declaration definition, and they were giving and granting refugee status. But as of today, this no longer this ceased um, to exist because, of course, recognizing refugees um, is politically means recognizing that a situation is not going well in Venezuela, and the current administration did not want to engage with such a recognition. So it it kind of uh, shifted. But I think there are. Um, the spaces, the regional spaces to to generate this dialogue and to generate, um, as we have been mentioning as well, um, shared solutions. And I think this has been the great, I'd say, lesson from what we've seen happening uh, right now. There's not been a comprehensive regional solution that could allow, for example, for the mobilization of um, migrants throughout the region without the need of changing uh, status in every uh, country, but like a wide mass regional solution. It's something that I think has been as, uh, attempted, but is not yet there. And the role of civil society has been key. I think in many cases, and and I think that, that the situation that Venezuelan migrants have today would not have been possible without the assistance that civil society organizations have been providing. Um, states, of course, hold the obligation to provide information to facilitate uh, the mechanisms. But the reality is that um, the flux of Venezuelan migrants was kind of a shock for countries. Like they didn't, they were not staffed at the beginning. So a lot of effort has been placed. And of course, what we have today doesn't look as it looked in 2016. It has been a, a, a massive increase in in personnel and in staff in the presence of international organizations at the border to assist these these uh, migrant Venezuelan migrants, but also in the capacity of civil society organizations to gather information to assist people to provide them legal assistance uh, to help them in following uh, regularization procedures to give them basic need uh, shelter. Um, as health assistance, etc. Especially in the case of migrant Venezuelan women who are pregnant, this has been vital, the presence of civil society organizations, and also assistance in acquiring regular status for their children. So many unaccompanied children or children born to migrant parents abroad have not been um, uh, accessing nationality for various reasons, and civil society organizations have made that possible as well. So I cannot uh, stress enough the relevance of the work that civil society organizations do. And I think considering whether it is better to have civil society organizations approach, I think in that sense, a comprehensive and of course, uh, continuous uh, common work. Civil society organizations need to work together with international organizations and international organizations need to support civil society. Also because I think migrants are more, uh, more, uh, I'd say, confident in accessing civil society organizations. They don't have the fear that they have, that they could have, for, especially when they are in an irregular status of going through authorities. So civil society organizations op um, offer an open space 
a very safe space for migrants to, to try to access information and to try to attain solutions for their situation, whether that is attainable, a durable, a durable solution in a specific country or continuing their migration route towards another place. And, and I think uh, civil society organizations are a key element and key actor in, in ensuring that that happens in a safety environment for all migrants. Maybe to to add very briefly to this, um, in, in, because I started by saying that more than 90% of our members of AFAV are from civil society. I just put in the chat one example um, of the Coalición por Venezuela, which is an umbrella organization of different diaspora organizations working for Venezuelan refugees and migrants and very, very effective and a very constructive role also in the engagement with, with governments, trying to not, because it's a very political issue, of course, um, and this is this is a difficulty that we see when we deal in this humanitarian space, how to maneuver between the politics and the humanitarian work and humanitarian work by definition needing to be more impartial as, as much as it could be. Um, but then some, I mean, also to be quite, to be a bit more self-critical, right? I think one of the things that the United Nations agencies are never good at is um, giving the visibility to those who are actually doing that kind of work. And it's a big challenge for us also, because when I said 90% of our memberships are already from civil society, still, I feel like there's a strong perception of us basically being IOM, UNHCR, UNICEF, the kind of big agencies. And that's a problem because it shouldn't be like this. We need to do better in visualizing and articulating the work that civil society does because it is so critical. And, and I would add, I've never worked in any emergency context as in this region where the diaspora has taken on such a strong and constructive role because sometimes it's even more political um, and it, it becomes a barrier in a way, right? To, to doing this humanitarian work and working constructively with governments, but it's never, never easy. Um, and then the last point on, yeah, I mean, of course governments, this is why in every presentation and every intervention we make, we always emphasize the main responsibility is with governments and they need to have the main response and we complement that. So that's always a very clear line. But in reality, it's also difficult. And, and so the last sentence on that is, I think we haven't talked so much today about um, impact of elections, political changes. We can speak about regularization. And maybe David will add something on that in, in Peru. But of course, when a government changes, um, things change and things are very fluid. Next year, we have elections in Colombia and in Brazil. That will likely bring very big changes. And so, yes, the role of everybody is very key and everybody needs to be able to move relatively quickly, I would add, probably with a lot of pragmatism as well, but based on a very principled um, approach. I think that's the biggest challenge. Well, actually, I wanted to open up the floor and see if any of our panelists who are, you know, who are so expert in their areas, but also have such overlap and synergy in their work, if you all had questions for each other, um, or possibly just additional comments that you wanted to make um, to complement what some of your co-panelists have, have spoken on. Sí, a mí me interesaría mucho eh, cómo ves tú, David, eh, la situación en Perú respecto al, a la regularización y, y respecto al diálogo con, con, el, con el gobierno justamente en esta época. Sí, bueno, el, el, el Estado peruano ha decidido, eh, a pesar de que la ley peruana del refugiado contiene una definición ampliada de, de, de refugiado, tal como como lo señala la, la declaración de Cartagena de 1984, el Estado peruano ha decidido eh, no reconocer a los migrantes venezolanos como refugiados, sino de acuerdo a la definición clásica de la Convención del 51. Y eh, hace pocos meses ha decidido que aquellos migrantes venezolanos que no, no califiquen de acuerdo a la definición clásica, eh, se les otorgará la calidad migratoria humanitaria. Eh, no obstante, eh, la Cancillería cuenta con muy poco personal y este proceso va a ser muy tedioso, pues eh, más de medio millón de personas ha solicitado eh, el reconocimiento de la condición de refugiados en el Perú. Eh, 
la academia peruana ha, ha, ha señalado en reiteradas oportunidades que se debería, para agilizar este procedimiento, hacer un reconocimiento masivo e ipso, eh, prima facie a todo ciudadano venezolano como eh, refugiado de acuerdo a la, al cumplimiento de la ley peruana y, por lo tanto, al cumplimiento de, de la eh, declaración de Cartagena del 84. Eh, no obstante, eh, el, Perú, eh, el Estado peruano teme una suerte de efecto llamada que propiciaría eh, un colapso de los servicios eh, públicos en el Perú. Ya tenemos cerca de un millón de, de venezolanos en nuestro territorio y se prevé que esta cifra continuará incrementándose en los próximos años. Eh, como he señalado, el Perú carece de políticas públicas eh, para migrantes y refugiados en nuestro país y el actual presidente ha tenido un discurso un tanto xenofóbico a lo largo de la campaña, incluso en su discurso inaugural señaló que se iba a expulsar dentro de las 72 horas eh, a todo ciudadano migrante que haya cometido algún tipo de delito o que haya ingresado de manera irregular a nuestro territorio, desconociendo la situación de vulnerabilidad de la población migrante que actualmente huye de una crisis humanitaria en su país y que por carecer eh, eh, de cualquier tipo de documento migratorio como el pasaporte, el Perú actualmente exige eh, eh, para entrar al territorio peruano pasaporte y una visa humanitaria, pero como bien sabemos estos son requisitos eh, sumamente eh, difíciles de conseguir para cualquier ciudadano en Venezuela. Un pasaporte, de acuerdo a algunas entrevistas y algunos estudios que se han realizado ya en el Perú y en otros países, cuesta a cualquier ciudadano venezolano a más de mil dólares y obviamente carecen de esa cantidad de dinero. Y además eh, la visa humanitaria en el consulado peruano también tiene un costo de, 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 de 40 dólares, si no, si no me equivoco. Ello, pues, sin duda alguna, imposibilita que, que, que realicen un ingreso regular a nuestro, a nuestro país. En ese sentido, eh, eh, actualmente también en estado diseñado el carnet de de, de temporal de permanencia, el CPP, eh, que también está en proceso de implementación. Pero no obstante, como, como he señalado, todos estos procesos son virtuales y lamentablemente se han evidenciado muchos casos de personas que no tienen acceso a un celular o una computadora, no tienen acceso a internet y han, y han desconocido todo este proceso de preinscripción y de inscripción y eh, van a permanecer de manera irregular en nuestro país hasta que se eh, reaperture eh, nuevamente el proceso de preinscripción. Eh, en ese sentido, eh, como, como he señalado, creo que el Estado peruano debe de eh, iniciar eh, de una vez por todas un servicio de, de atención personalizada, de acompañamiento, teniendo en consideración la situación de vulnerabilidad de muchos, de muchos migrantes venezolanos. He tenido yo la oportunidad de trabajar en la frontera norte peruana y he visto diariamente eh, eh, familias, niños, cruzando las trochas ilegales en, en condiciones realmente deplorables, indignas para, para, para cualquier persona, y que además eh, eh, la policía, el ejército que se ha desplegado en la frontera norte les ha imposibilitado el acceso a, a ciertos derechos, eh, ha habido expulsiones en, en caliente, como se, como, como se denomina, eh, vulnerando la ley migratoria, vulnerando los, los tratados internacionales, y en ese sentido creo que se necesita una gran campaña eh, nacional eh, para frenar también la ola migratoria, los medios de comunicación actualmente en nuestro país asimismo están eh, vinculando eh, eh, a la migración eh, irregular con actos delincuenciales y esto sin duda alguna eh, está perjudicando eh, el, el proceso de regularización. No obstante, también hay estudios eh, que señalan que no son de todo difundidos el impacto positivo en la economía peruana. Eh, en el Banco Continental, el BBVA, aquí en el Perú, eh, hizo un estudio y señaló que eh, la inmigración venezolana eh, propició que el PBI peruano creciera un punto porcentual más por encima de lo, de lo previsto y eh, asimismo tiene un gran impacto dentro de la recaudación eh, tributaria. Eh, lo que invierte el Estado peruano por cada migrante es mucho menor de los beneficios económicos que se obtiene de la migración venezolana. Eh, asimismo, eh, debemos de ser conscientes eh, eh, que muchos de los migrantes venezolanos eh, tienen altas calificaciones académicas. Eh, el Perú tiene un déficit, por ejemplo, de profesionales en salud y en educación. Eh, el año pasado el ministro de Salud indicaba que el Perú 
eh, tenía un déficit de 25.000 profesionales de la salud, médicos, enfermeras, eh, técnicos, etc. Y aún así, contratando a la mitad eh, de los estudiantes de estas carreras que, que, de nuestro país, no se podía cubrir, eh, mejor dicho, eh, contratando a la totalidad de los estudiantes, no se podría cubrir ni la mitad de este déficit. Entonces, sabemos que muchos profesionales en medicina de, de Venezuela han llegado al Perú, pero por no tener los recursos eh, económicos ni tener eh, el acceso a la información, pueden realizar estos, estos procedimientos porque son a veces extremadamente caros y desconocen todo el procedimiento que a veces suele ser muy engorroso de acuerdo a la legislación peruana. Thank you so much. So this has been such a rich and fruitful conversation. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a year. I think Tim um, alluded to a one-year webinar, which would certainly be a rich discussion. I think we would have plenty of space to fill it up. But I'm going to go ahead, um, you know, and and close our convening here. I do want to announce that. Uh, The next event for the Access to Information Conference is Thursday, September 16th, so in two days, and the panel there is Access to Health Rights and Information. Uh, I think Marcella just put a link in the chat, so we really encourage you to come to that one. I think it'll have a lot of good synergy with some of the topics that we talked about today, um, you know, not specific to refugees, but generally um, access to information, of course, the current context of the COVID pandemic, Um, etc. And again, I want to thank all of our panelists so much for making the time to join us and for sharing their expertise um, and for such an interesting and rich discussion. And thank you also, of course, um, to all of our attendees as well. Thank you so much to you. Thank you, Eunice, and thank you, Marcelo, and everyone at Arizona University for hosting us. Bye. Ciao.